<laughs> I want to thank Hussein and the other organizers for the invitation to speak here today. And I'm going to start by setting my timer so I know exactly how much I'm running over before Mike starts throwing things at me. Uh, my instructions were to give a seminar-like presentation about the uh, laboratory experiments that my group is carrying out. I'll be talking today about some of the work we're, we've done related to uh, first star formation. This work that we've performed at Columbia University with support from the <coughs> National Science Foundation. Uh, this funding was specifically from the Division of Chemistry. And I should also mention that I work for the AAS, the American Astronomical Society. I am a science editor for the Astrophysical Journal. So if you folks submit a manuscript related to astrochemistry, it will probably end up coming to me to look for reviewers and to oversee the process. So if anyone has any questions about how that is done and what the different steps are, please find me during one of the meals, uh, during one of the breaks, and ask me questions. And ask me questions during the presentation. If you don't ask questions, I'm going to start asking them of you. <laughs> All right. Here's an outline of the history of the cosmos. We've already heard this many times. It starts with the Big Bang. The Big Bang nucleosynthesis produces a few elements. The uh, universe expands. It cools down. It uh, becomes transparent to light at about 377,000 years. I'll talk about the cosmology that led to uh, star formation. And the chemistry for that, I, oh, this is the problem, okay. I hope it doesn't do that the whole time. Um, the chemistry for that kicked in, I was told like 15 million years after the Big Bang. The exact date doesn't matter, but it continues until about half a million years after the Big Bang, half a billion years after the Big Bang, where the first stars are formed and have reionized the uh, for star formation, these are population three stars, and everything is backwards in astronomy because we didn't figure things out in the order by which they happen. So population one stars are the ones that we see, like in the galactic disk, and population two are the ones in the bulge, population three are the first stars. So go figure. Uh, I'll talk about the chemistry that led to the formation of the first stars. John talked a little bit about that. Stefano talked, uh, alluded to some of that. I'll talk about the implications of the chemistry. Then I'll describe the laboratory studies that my group has performed. And then I'll present the results and describe the chemistry and bring it full circle and talk about the cosmology. Uh, so star formation. Here's a picture of the universe when it was, well, if you think about it in human terms, four days old. So this is the cosmic microwave background. And these fluctuations, the red are the denser regions, the blue are the under dense regions. And these are the seeds for the formation of structure that we see today. The regions of overdensity have slightly higher gravitational attraction, so they attract more material towards them, and you get a runaway effect leading to the formation of clouds, which go on to form proto-galaxies and then galaxies and stars. So the collapse of these clouds, in the modern universe, the collapse is controlled by, we have a periodic table of elements, as you guys have seen multiple times. Not all of them are equally Important. I don't have the nice slide that Stefano showed or um, Mike showed earlier. Um, in the early universe, we only really have to worry about three elements. Hydrogen, helium, and lithium. And to be honest, we can ignore helium and lithium. <laughs> so for the purposes of today's talk, this is the periodic table I'm going to work with. Okay? Having trained as an atomic physicist, I'm very happy. Start here. Okay, structure formation in the early universe. We have these clouds that are held together gravitationally that are on the order of 90% hydrogen, 10% helium, insignificant amounts of lithium. They're held together by gravity. As the cloud collapses, the ideal gas law tells us that the volume goes down so the temperature goes up. 
If there were no mechanism for the clouds to cool, the thermal pressure would halt the collapse of the cloud and stop the formation of the star. So, how do the clouds cool? Well, one mechanism by which they cool is Lyman alpha emission from atomic hydrogen. So electrons excite a 1s electron to the 2s level, 2p level, and that radiates a Lyman alpha photon that eventually leaves the cloud. Uh, that is done by the population in the tail of the Maxwell-Boltzmann distribution of hydrogen velocities, and that can cool the cloud down to a temperature of about 8,000 Kelvin. How does, that's still too hot to form a star. So the question is, how does the cloud get cool enough so gravitational runaway can take over and form a pre-stellar core? What happens below 8,000 Kelvin? The answer is that this is where, yes? Maybe because I'm right now working on it, how do we know that the thermalization here is maximum? Velocity? That's a very good question. And that's something that I'm not able to answer. What I've done is I've taken models sure. that other people have carried out where they make that assumption. And they have also performed sensitivity studies. So early universe chemistry, hydrogen, helium, lithium. I did a paper with Simon Glover. We had almost 500 reactions in our chemical network. But people have done sensitivity studies to determine that only about half a dozen or so are, are really important. Those models have all assumed the thermodynamic equilibrium. And it is an open question. I think, John, you had that in your presentation. Um, how, how accurate is that? Um, and I have to look to the modelers to, to figure it out and to tell us how accurate it is. But these are great questions. Yeah. yeah I guess the analysis are far from the equilibrium, I think John mentioned that too. And the way they sort of approach equilibrium may not necessarily be Maxwell Boltzmann. I'm taking with I'm yeah. working with what the cosmological no, 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 models have given us. This is just for the yeah. same two is there are there are there is at least one paper where they show the non thermal thermal effect. There, but I don't remember which paper. Yeah, well, there are several kinds of effects. It's a, a, a long story. Yeah. So, the, um, so it's, let's, let's save it for another discussion. Yeah, it's a very, very interesting question. Yeah. Uh, this may actually be exactly where uh, where some of the problems still lie in the, uh, the mm -hmm. cosmological mm -hmm. problems. All right. So moving on then. I apologize, but um, this is how molecular hydrogen cools the clouds to temperatures of 200 Kelvin. So this is a toy model that a toy, sorry, it's a cartoon that an undergraduate did for me. We have molecular hydrogen in the upper left. We can tell it's cold because it's neither vibrating nor rotating. And we have a fast or hot hydrogen atom. And the hydrogen atom is going to collide with the molecule. And when it collides with the molecule, it's going to lose kinetic energy. It's going to cool down. And the molecule is going to take up oh, mist. Uh, the molecule eventually will take up that energy as rotational energy. And now that rotationally excited molecule relaxes and radiates the energy out of the cloud. This is the catalytic process by which H2 cooled the clouds down to temperatures on the order of 200 Kelvin. H2 is homonuclear. It has no dipole moment. This is a quadrupole transition, so it's very slow. So it gives one a sense of what, how long the mean collision time is in these primordial clouds. Chemistry evolves very slowly. Uh, this is a movie, which, oh man. No, you can see it here. Can you? Well, oh, okay. Yes. Look at the screens on the side. Thank you. OK, so this is a, con a computational simulation. That was done by my colleague at Columbia, um, Greg Ryan, uh, and his collaborators. It takes into account general relativity, hydrodynamics, chemistry, and it's modeling the collapse and the formation of structure in the early universe. There is no sound with this movie. Who knows why there's no sound with this movie? Because there's space going in. 
Exactly. Space in the back here that no one can hear you scream. Exactly. Thank you. So, okay, what we're looking at are density contours of atomic hydrogen. Each contour is in order of magnitude, and we see the filaments that uh, were shown earlier in the observation. Oh, well, that's another model, actually. And you can see the material is collapsing towards the interstice where we have an overdensity of material. Uh, the rotation is mostly, I think, from the observer's perspective here. Eventually, we're going to dive into the center of the collapsing cloud. And what we're going to see at this point is going to turn blue. And now the cloud's gone entirely molecular hydrogen. And the simulation has basically stopped. And we're seeing density contours in H2. Each density contour is a factor of 10 increase. And in the center is a, a prestellar core that's eventually going to form a first star. You'll see it eventually. This simulation does not model the actual collapse of the star. So that white thing in there is about the resolution they were able to get at 2000. 2009. We can do a little, they can do a little bit better now, but it's still tough to actually resolve over so many orders of magnitude. Now we're starting to run away. Why are we running away from this star? What happens to a star at the end of its lifetime? It blows up! You don't want to be near the star when it blows up. And this star, in its evolution, forges elements heavier than helium. Those elements are then spewed out into the interstellar medium intergalactic medium, and they go into the formation of clouds that can create the second and third generation of stars. So I, just, I show this to kind of demonstrate where the chemistry, how the chemistry plays a role in the modeling. What is the chemical reaction that we're important about this, the formation of H2, during the epic proto-galaxy and for star formation. I'm using the word proto-galaxy because these clouds are galactic in size, but they don't have a star yet. And as I mentioned earlier in the answer to the Saint's question, uh, there have been sensitivity studies that have identified the key chemical networks leading to the form key chemical reactions leading to the formation of H2. And the process is called associative detachment. I live in New York City. A lot of my friends are therapists. They, they tell me if someone walked into their office with this condition, they'd probably prescribe some of the primordial lithium. <laughs> All right. <laughs> so, this is not a condition that you will find in DSM-5 or any other such uh, manual. This is the most fundamental anion neutral chemical reaction leading to the formation of a molecule. And when we started working on this project in 2005, this was very poorly understood. So, here are the published data before we did our experiment. This is the rate coefficient or kinetics as a function of temperature. There are three data points, the black circles. They were all carried out at room temperature with a technique that's called the flowing afterglow. I'm not going to describe how that technique works, but I will say that we have shifted the data points by plus or minus 25 Kelvin just so that you can see them. And these data points have error bars of up to a factor of two because of the challenge of me measuring the hydrogen number density. This is the newest experimental point. So naively, we think that these theoretical calculations are probably right. Everything else on this plot is a theoretical calculation. Well, the problem is that these are the newest theories. So there's over an order of magnitude spread between the highest theoretical calculation and the lowest experimental error. And that has significant implications for the cosmological formation of the first stars. Uh, we're limited in our, in our ability to model the formation of proto-galaxies, uh, the cooling time for the formation of the first stars, and what are the characteristic masses of the first stars. 
And I'll explain these more in detail in, in detail in, in this implication section. Uh, yes, please. In this model you just showed, this, do you know what's sort of the physical reason of this maximum at 100K? In these calculations here? Right. Uh, I do. Can I save that punchline for later? Okay. Yeah. yeah. But thanks for asking. Um, so, the implications. Let me so, describe. Dan, I have a question back at that slide as well. Are the error bars smaller than the points that you measured? The error bars here? Yeah. Uh, one of the error bars is allegedly 40%. The others are more like a factor of two ish. No, no, but you show. I'm confused. Red is that your measurements? No, none of these are experimental oh, results from my group. I, I can draw these, these are all measurements that were carried out before we did our work. Yeah. Perhaps it's also worth mentioning that these are extremely high rate constants. Yeah, you could say that. 10 to the minus, they're over 10 to the minus 9 centimeters cubed per second. That's right. This dashed line is the Langevin rate coefficient. Uh, which just takes into account the dipole polarizability of the system. Uh, first star formation. The upper limit for the mass of the star is determined by the balance between the outward pressure and the inward gravitational force. And that hydrostatic equilibrium is commonly known as the Gene's mass, which is given by this equation here. Gene's mass is proportional to the temperature to the three halves power over the square root of the number density. I apologize, I'm not using brackets for those chemists in the audience for number density. Um, but we tend to use just simple N for number density. Uh, okay, uncertainties in the genes mass translate directly into uncertainties in our understanding of the elemental evolution of the cosmos. Stars are factories that forge the elements. And how far up on the periodic table that a star can forge to depends on the gravitational potential energy in the star. So a star like the sun can forge up to elements like carbon and oxygen, and then there's no more potential energy to convert to nuclear synthesis into heavier elements. But if the star is 10 times the mass of the sun, it can synthesize elements all the way up to the iron peak. So, if we have an uncertainty in the genes mass, we have an uncertainty in the chemical evolution of the cosmos. And these are the implications for first star formation. This is a model that my colleague Simon Glover performed. Uh, it's really interesting how Simon and I met. I wrote a paper where I took a published cross-section. I convolved it with the Maxwell-Boltzmann distribution to generate a thermal rate coefficient. I fit that rate coefficient to a simple function for use in astrochemical models. And the day it came out online, I got an email from Simon, Dear Dr. Savin, I think you have an error in your fitting formula. The whole point of that paper was that fitting formula, and I got it wrong. I used the fit parameters for natural log, but the equation was in log 10. So I, I had done it both ways, and I just not double checked. That, by the way, is the last paper I have ever written as a sole author. <laughs> <laughs> um, OK. So it also led to a nice collaboration with Simon. We collaborated on half a dozen different papers. Some of my most highly cited papers grew out of that stupid mistake. Uh, it's a 3D simulation, and this is a plot showing the temperature as a function of number density. Uh, what we're looking at is a spherical shell of material surrounding the center of the cloud, and the uh, circles are representing the temperature of each, each sphere as we're moving in towards the center of the cloud. So the red data points are when we use a slow rate coefficient for this reaction, and the black are when we use a fast rate coefficient. This inflection point determines the stellar mass scale, and I'm going to skip over the astrophysical uh, reason why that is so. Let's just take that as a given. 
So in one case, when we use a slow rate coefficient for the reaction, here's the lowest temperature and density that one gets. When we use a fast rate coefficient, this is the minimum temperature and corresponding density. You put that into the Jeans mass equation, and there's a factor of 20 uncertainty. That has significant implications for our understanding of the chemical evolution, chemical in the sense of elemental evolution of the cosmos. So, before I move on to the next section, questions, please. Please. Yes, in the back. A really simple question, but how did someone figure out that the fundamental reaction that makes hydrogen is hydride plus a proton or plus a hydrogen atom, not just two hydrogen atoms coming together and no side product? So two hydrogen atoms coming together to make H2 have to release a photon in order to conserve energy and momentum. There are two particles in, you have to have two particles go out. And they did calculations for the radiative association rate and found that it was far too low to uh, be of, of any significance. I should also emphasize this is the early universe. There is no dust. So H2 cannot form on the surface of dust grains. It has to be a gas-based process. Other questions? Yes, please. Um, can you go back to your last plot? This one? Yeah, so right at the um, tail end where your low in temperature and upper density is high, yeah. um, why does it start to spread out? It has to do with the, um, the number of shells and such, I think, are becoming, the number of particles in each shell is decreasing because the, the effective volume of the shell is decreasing. So what we're seeing here, I believe, is just um, number statistics. So, yes? Like the same plot, why? I guess we got this as, but why is there such a high increase for the lower number? Or is that, is that the, the, uh, the actual astronomy reason you want us to skip over? Why does it go back up? Uh, or what do you mean? Yeah, yeah, why is it? Why, like, why is there an inflection point? Yeah. Is why, is this, why is the temperature so high for the wind? Why is the temperature so high at this end yeah. or at this end? Both, yeah, well, at this end, there's no cooling mechanism. The cooling oh, is okay, okay. At this density, at this point here, the hydrogen, the H2, is cooling the gas. And I think what's happening here is you get uh, gravitational collapse that is uh, heating the gas again. Okay. But not having carried out the model, I wouldn't be surprised if this last half of what I said is wrong. Oh. <laughs> but there's the H2 cooling restriction from this. Yeah, they hear you. Other questions? Okay. I told you I would make folks ask questions. All right, let me talk about the laboratory work. And I'm going to go into a fair amount of detail here because I believe most of you folks will never have encountered these techniques before. And you may not have an opportunity to see a presentation where it kind of talks about the nitty gritty that goes into making a measurement. Um, so we use what's called the self-merged genes technique. We have gas discharge, represented here by, this is not Pac-Man, this is one of the little creatures that get eaten, right? Yeah, okay, good. I'm glad to see that you guys know Pac-Man. It's made it through several generations. We make a beam of H minus, which is represented by these yellow dots here. And then we take a really, really powerful laser. You guys recognize this? <laughs> All right, we take a kick-ass laser. It's a 1.4 kilowatt infrared laser. We shoot it across the H minus, and we convert about 10% of the H minus through photo detachment into neutral hydrogen atoms. We measure the probability for the H and the H minus to react and make H2. That's the big picture concept. Now I'm going to go into some of the details. Our signal is the H2. This is a um, AutoCAD. This is a three-dimensional um, software drawing program for. Uh, 
computer-aided design program of the apparatus, and I just want to go over some of the details. We have our gas discharge sources here, we make H minus. We have a charge to mass filter here that separates out all of the negatively charged particles that are produced in the source. It could be electrons, it could be O minus, H minus. We use charge to mass selection. And now we have a pure beam of H minus, which is guided with electrostatic optics. We deflect the beam electrostatically 90 degrees. And the reason we deflect it is we don't want ultraviolet light from the ion source to make it into the interaction region where it could affect the chemistry. We don't want H2 molecules, which flow out of the source, to make it into the interaction region, which could affect the chemistry. We deflect the beam 90 degrees. And then we have our laser. We shine our laser across the H minus B. And the atomic hydrogen is created through the photon detachment. So here's the scheme. Here's our photon detachment region. It's about two meters long. We have our H minus B come in. The laser crosses the H minus beam at an angle of the about 2.7 degrees, and they overlap for about 20 centimeters. We form ground state hydrogen through photodetachment. So the H minus only has one bound state. It's a singlet S0. And we photodetach into the hydrogen doublet S1 half. We don't care about the electron after photodetachment. And the efficiency the photodetachment efficiency is given by the laser power divided by the velocity of the H minus and the sine of the angle between the two beams. So that's why we use such a shallow angle between, because the sine is in the denominator. So we want this number to be as small as possible to make this number as large as possible. If we use a 90 degree overlap, the efficiency would be down by over an order of magnitude. Yes? Why do you use 975 nanometers as opposed to the wavelength? As opposed to what? A different wavelength. That's a good question. If you look at the photo detachment cross section from threshold, it peaks at a photon wavelength of about 975. So we choose that to maximize the cross section for photo detachment. Is your laser source tunable or is it? No, it's a diode laser. It's, um, and I'll show the laser in just a minute. Uh, like I said, here's the laser. <laughs> All right, so this is the laser system. Um, it consists of these bars. Each bar has like 25 emitters on it. And each stack, which is about 24 millimeters in height, each stack has 12 bars. So we have um, a mirror. So the light from this stack here reflects off this mirror. We have an interleaved mirror here that lets the light from this stack behind it transmit through. And the light from this mirror gets reflected off of this interleaved mirror. So it's transparent, reflecting, transparent, reflecting. And the, whoops, these optics here focus the beam down at the region where we do the photo detachment. So these are the signal, this is the simulated uh, laser output at the vacuum window going into the photo detachment chamber. Uh, it's about 25 millimeters square. And this is what it, this is measured. This is what it looks like in the focus region. It's five millimeters high and 15 millimeters wide. That's a lot of power in there, 1.4 kilowatts. You can cook a steak. Uh, we actually at one point had it hitting the wall of the vacuum chamber, and we were spraying water on it. The water was boiling off. Um, we have a lot of laser safety in our laboratory. This is not a simple class 4 laser. This is a 1.4 kilowatt class 4 laser in the infrared, which you can't see with your eye. So by the time you realize you've been exposed to this laser light, it's too late, you're blind. So we have a lot of laser safety in my lab. 
Sorry, what, what kind of laser is this? Is it homemade laser? No, no, we, we bought it from a company that primarily supplies military equipment. <laughs> yeah. So I have more than that, I'm not at liberty to discuss. <laughs> but this, this, so it's, it's just a commercial laser? It's a commercially available laser, that's right. It's about $100,000. So if you want one of these for a toy. Um, Okay, the photo detachment happens inside a floating cell that we put to a potential. And by varying the floating cell potential, u sub f, we can vary the relative energy between the beams. So let me explain how we do that. This is a common technique in fast beams physics. Um, before the floating cell, the h minus beam has an energy that is the potential on the source, and that's about 10 kilovolts. These are fast beams. These are not molecular beams. They're not moving at thermal energies. They're moving at like 10 to the 7 centimeters per second. Inside the floating cell, which has a potential of use of F, the H minus beam has the sum of that potential. And the hydrogen that's formed has an energy that's equivalent to the sum of those potentials. When the beams leave the floating cell, the H minus gets accelerated or decelerated back to its initial energy because it's affected by the change in the potentials. But the hydrogen beam is neutral. It's not affected by the change in the potentials. So by varying the floating cell potential, we can vary the relative collision energies. And like I said, well, it's like fast cars on the highway. They're moving really fast in the laboratory, but we can make the relative velocity correspond to energies that, that simulate uh, temperatures as low as 10 Kelvin. So we can get right to the temperature range that's relevant for a lot of astrochemistry. The beams co-propagate, I just said that. Now we have the interaction region here. And we have beam profile monitors that allow us to measure the shapes of the beams. And these are what the beams look like. These are the vertical and horizontal profiles at the beginning of the interaction region, at the end of the interaction region. These amplitudes are in arbitrary units. You can see that the beams overlap very nicely. Well, it's a self-merged beam. We're creating the H out of the H minus, and this is what we expect. Um, H is shown by the solid line, H minus by the dash line. The associative detachment process forms H2 with an energy that's roughly the sum of the H and the H minus, or 20 kV. We electrostatically remove the H minus. We deflect it into a Faraday cup. This is a metal cup that we use to measure the current. And now we have 100 per second of H2 within a parent beam of 10 to the 11 per second of H. That is a signal to noise ratio of 10 to minus 9. And that would be a killer unless we had a trick up our sleeves. Now when I wrote this proposal, our idea was actually to try to detect the detached electrons. And I hired several postdocs on the project, and we were working on it for almost a year. And they came to me, and they're like, Daniel, I'm sorry, we are just not going to be able to detect these electrons. There are too many stray fields and other issues that will prevent us from doing it. So imagine yourself, one year into your postdoc, realizing that you have signed on to a failure. OK? We were, well, we were shitting bricks, okay? <laughs> and we spent a month trying to brainstorm to figure out how to salvage this experiment and make the measurement. And we finally came up with a solution. And the answer is we send both neutral beams through a helium gas cell where collision ionization converts about 5% of the H2 into H2 plus, and the hydrogen into protons. And then that 
I, I mentioned that the signal to noise ratio before was 10 to the minus 9, but we can electrostatically deflect the desired daughter products, the H2 plus, onto a detector with no background, and I'll show you that in a moment. Energetically, we separate the 20 kb H2 plus from the 10 kb protons. And the signal to noise ratio goes from 10 to the minus 9 to basically infinity. So we thought of ourselves as gods when we came <laughs> up. Uh, or at least really damn lucky. So, so this, is, this is how it works. This is the neutral, these are the neutral beams, the H2 and the H. This is our helium gas cell. We have 10 to the minus 4 tor of helium in the gas cell. We have a neutral cup here that we use to measure the neutral hydrogen atom particle part. The H plus is formed through <coughs> stripping, and we also have H2 plus that's formed. This is a turbo molecular pump to create the vacuum. So H minus that's formed goes into our final electrostatic energy analyzer, and it only has 10 kilovolts, so it gets deflected onto this inner plate of the first um, cylindrical deflector. The H2 plus has an energy that, of 20 kV, and we've set the voltages on these electrostatic optics so that it will transmit the 20 kV protons onto a channel electron multiplier. So we just count the number of daughter products as we vary the relative energy between the beams. It's a detector. The signal measurement, and I want to go through this because it's really important to understand how we get rid of these backgrounds. We chop our hydrogen beam on and off. We chop the, sorry, H minus beam. We chop the hydrogen beam by turning the laser on and off. We chop the H minus beam by electrostatically deflecting the beam so it goes through the interaction region or it doesn't go into the interaction region. Uh, in the first quarter of this chopping pattern, we have four rates. We have the signal, we have the background of the H minus, background of the hydrogen, and any noise in the system. In the second quartile of the chopping pattern, we only have the background of the H minus and noise. In the third, we have the background only due to the H and noise. And the fourth is just noise because both beams are up. So we can take these four equations, and this is a mathematical problem that I can solve. And we can rearrange it. I'm sorry if you can't see the red very well. Uh, the signal is just R1 minus R2 minus R3 plus R4. You can see it better on the monitors there. So that's the chopping pattern that we use to extract our signal from the various backgrounds in the experiment. This is a common technique in fast beams studies. Uh, we scan the analyzer voltage to find the H2 plus signal. This is the signal as we scan the analyzer voltage. That's the uh, H2 plus in R1, the first quartile. This is R2, that's R3, and the blue is R4. And this is an arbitrary unit. And now, if you recall this equation, here's the signal as a function of analyzer voltage, we have a nice plateau here. And we have zero background. So we just set our analyzer voltage in the middle of the plateau, and we make our measurement. So, essentially no background. This is the day after of the apparatus, the day after we got first signal. You can tell we got this smiley. <laughs> the H minus is a gas discharge source which is behind this power control rack. We extract the beam, we deflect it 90 degrees. Um, this light type box houses the laser. We shoot it across the ions, we photo detach about 10%, making a neutral H beam. They form H2, the H and H minus. We deflect the H minus out of the way. This is the H2 that's formed, it goes through the helium gas cell where it's converted to H2 plus, and then it's electrostatically deflected onto a detector, forming H2 plus. So this is another question for you guys. How much did this cost? 
How much was the grant funded for? No, no, no. Only the students. <laughs> Come on, give me a number. It doesn't matter. Guess. What's the students? Two million dollars. What? One million? Two million. Two million? Five hundred thousand dollars. Okay. This cost seven hundred thirty-five thousand and change. Half of that went to equipment. A quarter of that went to salaries. And the remaining quarter goes to the overhead charged by the university for electricity, for the building staff, for the administrative staff. And the reason I put this up is because most of you folks haven't had a chance to write grant applications. So you don't really have a sense yet of how much this work costs. We don't know what lies ahead. What? They do not know what lies ahead. Yeah, we're trying to give them... Don't scare them. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so, I had never built an apparatus before. This is the first time I'd ever built an experiment. I wrote the proposal. The first time it was declined. I revised it. Second time I get a phone call from the program manager. She says, Dr. Savin, this is so-and-so from the NSF. I'd like to tell you your proposal's been selected for funding. I'm like, oh, I'm really excited. This is wonderful. I'm looking forward to work working with the NSF on that. Hang up the phone. And my first thought was like, oh my god, I got to do it. <laughs> but look, we all have PhDs, or we'll soon have PhDs. We're smart. We'll figure it out. And I hired very talented people to do the work. I wrote the grant application. You don't want me in the laboratory, do you? Uh, Jan-Mar Bruns and Holger Kreckel are two postdocs of mine from Germany who did the lion's share of the construction and the experiments for H minus on H. Ken Miller from the United States, he measured D minus on D. And my collaborator Xavier Bond from Université Catholique de Le Mans in um, Belgium. I would encourage everyone to collaborate with someone from Belgium because they tend to bring chocolate. <laughs> now the beer is harder to bring through security. Um, these magnetic field coils here are to compensate against the Earth's magnetic field. Even though this beam is moving at 10 to the 7 centimeters per second, it is a hydrogen ion, cap and ion and it's light enough to be deflected five millimeters from here to here. Questions? Yes? So, I think I heard you say that the efficiency of the conversion, 5% of the H2 gets converted to H2 plus? That's right. right. So, I'm sorry if this doesn't come out right, but if you don't know how much H2 you started with, because it's mixed with H, then how did you figure out that the conversion efficiency sorry, is 5%? And that question will be answered in just about two slides. I'm sorry. Yeah. Other questions? I'll start asking you guys questions. Yes, please. How did you benchmark each like section of the apparatus? Does that, does that make sense? Or did you? Well, we benchmarked it in various ways. We, we measure the ion current at different points. And um, we, so we, we watch the decrease in the ion current as it moves through the apparatus because the effective solid angle that gets transmitted out of the source uh, decreases as one moves away. And you can calculate how much you expect for decrease and, and it matches. Is that. Um, these Faraday cups, when the H minus B hits the Faraday cup, it knocks electrons off. You want to prevent those electrons from leaving. So you have to put a positive voltage, sorry, a negative voltage on the entrance aperture of the Faraday cup to keep the electrons inside. We measure the current as we vary the um, voltage on that and we watch it make a plateau. So there are a whole bunch of different things that we did to calibrate the apparatus. Okay, so the chemistry. Oh, I've got a question. Please. Um, so when you do the photo detachment, uh, does the laser come in parallel with the H minus beam or it comes at an angle? An angle of 2.7 degrees. Okay, um, so I think you mentioned you're afraid that H, um, the H beam might be deflected. Not the H minus. Not the H minus. 
Uh, I think you, um, on your last slide you mentioned you're afraid that uh, the hydrogen will be deflected by the Earth uh, magnetic field. Not the neutral hydrogen, the hydrogen anion, the H minus, because it's charged, can be deflected by the Earth's magnetic field. Right. So the question is, if the photon, uh, if the laser comes in at an angle, because photon carries momentum. Yeah. So why would it uh, photon cause the H minus to deflect it due to the you know, momentum? The, the, the momentum transfer is insignificant. And if you think about how many photons are used in ultra cold trapping of atoms and molecules, it's tens to hundreds of thousands. And this is a single photon absorption. So, and the electron also carries off a lot of the momentum. Other questions? Okay. So what we measure is a rate coefficient. And this rate coefficient the signal rate for H2 formation is the cross-section for associative detachment times the relative velocity between the beams as a function of position. The hydrogen number density as a H minus number density as a function of position. The hydrogen number density as a function of position integrated over the overlap region in the interaction region of the experiment. That's what we, that's the signal rate for H2. We have to take into account that we don't measure the H2, we measure the H2 plus. And so what we get is, and we rearrange this equation. Uh, I'll skip the algebra. So we measure the cross section times the relative velocity. These brackets means that it's averaged over the experimental energy spread, which is not the same as a maxwell boltzmann distribution. So it's a rate coefficient, but it's an experimental merged beams Here's the H2 plus signal rate. We divide that by the cross section for stripping, which is known, to, which has been measured by others. So this is now answering your question. This is the stripping cross section, and this is the column density of helium in the gas cell. So these terms allow us to convert our H2 plus signal into an H2 signal. <clears throat> Here we've got uh, the unit charge squared, the velocities of the two beams, and the currents of the two beams. This is effectively the densities. And then this last term is the overlap between the two beams. It's a geometric quantity. <clears throat> Excuse me. So this is the merged beams rate coefficient as a function of relative energy. The circles are the measurements. The error bars are the one sigma counting statistics. <coughs> the dotted curve is the total experimental uncertainty. It's on the order of plus or minus 25%. The solid, solid curve is a theoretical calculation. <coughs> Excuse me from our colleagues in Prague, Martin Chizik. And the dash curve is the Langevin rate coefficient. So, we have excellent agreement with the calculations of Chizik and all, in both the magnitude and the energy dependence. Uh, one may ask why, and actually, we did get that question. Why is the merged beams rate coefficient so much higher than the Langevin value. And the answer for that is that the H minus polarizes the H. And now the polarized H back polarizes the H minus, creating an attractive potential that's more attractive than dipole. And that explains this enhancement here. When the collision has enough energy for collisional detachment to take over, it takes all of the reaction flux. <clears throat> we published this in 2010. We wrote the proposal and we got funded. We wrote the proposal in 2005. We got funded in 2010. We published it, sorry, 2006. We published it in 2010. That's five years for one reaction. Okay? It's very important for people like myself to have sensitivity studies 
to identify what are the key reactions that limit our understanding of the cosmology or the astrochemistry. We do not want to waste our time or taxpayer dollars measuring something that is insignificant for advancing our understanding of astrochemistry and astrophysics. So for those of you in the audience who do astrochemical modeling, I would strongly encourage you to include sensitivity studies in your work to guide people like myself. Um, <clears throat> okay, we convert our results to a thermal rate coefficient. This is what we measured, the cross-section times relative velocity can follow with the energy spread of the experiment. We know the energy spread of the experiment because we know the beam shapes, we know the trajectory geometry, and we know the energy spreads of the beams. So we can extract the cross-section, and then it is just trivial to evolve with a maximum Boltzmann distribution to get a thermal rate coefficient. I showed this earlier. These are our experimental results. The solid black line shows our experimentally generated thermal rate coefficient. The dashed lines show the plus or minus 25% uncertainty. So these diamonds here, these triangles, I mean, are measurements that were carried out after our work by a different group. They trap H minus in a 22 pole electrostatic RF trap. Um, sorry, ignore the electrostatic, it was a radio frequency trap. And they flowed H into the trap and they looked at the loss of the H minus as a function of time, which is signaled H2 formation. And they're in really good agreement with our results and with the most recent theoretical calculations. So 2010, quantum mechanics was discovered in 1925. It only took almost a century for theory and experiment to finally converge for the most fundamental anion neutral molecular formation process. Humbling, to say the least. I do laboratory astrophysics. Everything I do is motivated by questions in astrophysics. It's very important to always complete the circle. So let's look at the cosmological <clears throat> I showed this model earlier. Uh, the red and the black curves you may recognize from before. The green data points, which are hard to see, are the benchmark theoretical calculations. The magenta are plus 25% and the blue are minus 25%. This is the inflection point determining the stellar mass limit. We now have a minimum temperature and corresponding density for one extreme here and for the other extreme here. You put that into the genes mass equation and the uncertainty goes from a factor of 20 to a factor of 2. So we've dramatically improved our understanding of the underlying chemistry so that remaining discrepancies between observations and the cosmological simulations tell us something about the cosmology and not about how poorly we understand chemistry. We got a lot of press about this. We made the home page of the NSF. We were pretty excited about that. Um, and also this inspired an artwork by a colleague of mine. It was based on our experiment. Making the abstract sensory through sound. So they were insisting, what is the sound of this? And I, the only thing I could think of was, well, if you take Lyman alpha and you convert it into a sound, what do you get? And the answer was C sharp. So the sound was C sharp. And they created this yurt like, womb like structure to embody the birth and the formation of the first star. It's a sculpture of wood, felt, and a hoggy desk. Go figure. Barbara Yance, the artist who's in the middle here, is a vegetarian, but her favorite medium is high intestines. Uh, Garth Wickham worked on the sound, that's myself. So it's been a lot of fun doing the science, and it also led to a lot of fun artwork. And um, if you want to find out more, starboom.com. Basically, I'd like to stop there. Thank you all for your attention and take any remaining questions.
Yes, please. So that doesn't think like it's a problem anymore because your experiment fit the theory so well. But did you have to consider secondary reactions um, that would deplete H2? Um, in, in the experiment? Yeah. So the, the, the residual gas density in the beam line is low enough that the probability of the signal molecule reacting with a residual gas molecule is extremely low. Yes? What is the adaptability of that setup? So um, what, what's next, I guess, or what have you done since then in that, in that experiment? So H minus on H, it's a first row element. <coughs> so we, <coughs> sorry, excuse me. We wrote a proposal to NSF Chemistry to do measurements of associative attachment for systems of increasing electronic complexity. Um, a second row element, a third row element, and a fourth row element. And it was submitted to NSF Chemistry, and they wrote back and they said, well, chemistry is really interested in complexity, and you've just got two atoms. This should be submitted to physics. We submitted the proposal revised to physics, and they wrote, well, the Saturn group does great work, but this is not where the physics community is today. And so it got declined from both programs. So that project is dead. And out of its ashes, we have built an ion beam line to simulate solar wind ion irradiation of regolith like loose powder, simulating the interaction of the surface of mercury with the solar wind, which I call the Phoenix Project because it's risen out of the ashes of that project. So that demonstrates to you, from my very biased perspective, that even if the scientific question is good, science has fads, and chemistry wants to deal with large molecules, physics wants to deal with ultra-fast and ultra-cold, and if you can't couple a compelling scientific question with something that the review panels are willing to fund, you're not going to get funded. So yes, oh, I was saying and then. Not really. Okay. Yeah. Um, because this is a benchmark benchmark experiment, uh, could you take us back to your description of this um, enhancement of this bump of the rate? I want, I want to understand, you're, you're referring to some sort of a back reaction, I think. So these are very light systems. Yeah. And my understanding is, it's been explained to me by the theorists, is that the polarized hydrogen atom, mm -hmm. its polarization can polarize the H minus. Can only do so if H minus has non de has degenerate states, not when it doesn't have it as a non degenerate state. In other words, the polarization on H minus, yeah. which only has one bound state, yeah. it's uh, it's trivial, it's, it's zero. I I have to apologize, but I'm parroting what my I see. Okay. theoretical no, I just want to sort of understand because if you have a degenerate state, yes, the potential exists that you would polarize. The yeah. others do this back action and create another set of dipoles. Yeah. H minus only has one bound state. Yeah. So it can form a dipole. But, but we, we should talk more about sure. that sure. offline. Um, so no, 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 I just want to understand because these are beautiful experiments. I mean, these are long standing challenges in, in both chemistry and, and, and physics. So, yeah. John, do you have a question? Yeah, but I think you mentioned that one of your groups studied the D minus. D. Yeah. And I just wondered if the result of that process appears to follow a simple mass scale relation. Uh, or if there's anything special or different that you learn from this I think the answer is yes, but I, I before I, I I need to look at the D minus D paper and remind myself of those results. Um, so I'll show that to you during one break. Yeah. Um, at this point, I'm at 59 minutes and 20 seconds. Uh, so maybe I should stop here and uh, thank you all for your attention. If you have any more questions, you can ask me during any of the breaks. Thank you.